This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the four-pound pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk. It's the True Faith Newcastle United podcast. Newcastle have done what they needed to do. They went to Brentford on the final day of the season and secured seventh place and hopeful, probable, Europa Conference football next season. I'm told it's called the UEFA Conference. I'll have to get myself trained out of that (laughs) incorrect use of the name. All that mattered today was winning, winning well. They did it. I'm Alex, I'm joined by John Lane, Ben Wade and Charlotte Robson and we're here to discuss the crucial victory, the last victory, the last game of the season against Brentford at the Community Stadium. Charlotte Newcastle are seventh, they did what they needed to do, four goals and away win, couldn't have gone much better could it? Yeah it couldn't have gone, well I guess it could, they could have scored no goals and we could have just had that four but yeah it couldn't have gone better, we were, um, we needed a win, we needed to go to Brentford and secure that win today, we needed it, that, honestly I would have taken any kind of shithousery win, like it didn't matter how we did it but we did it reasonably comfortably, that first half was, um, was was we were cruising, the second half was that sort of 20 minute awkward period and then it was just fine, um, players back sunny day uh, yeah we it, it really couldn't have gone better and uh and we've we've finished above man U for the first time in premier league history so if nothing else we've got that but i'm very pleased we managed to pull it out of the bag today and um and do what we needed to do i think there were nerves around it even though brentford aren't technically a brilliant side um still nervous still felt a bit sort of oh god we just just really need to get it and we did and it's okay and everything's fine Ben, I put in our WhatsApp group at half time that at 3 0 up, I'd almost forgiven them for Wednesday night. You were probably the only other person who was as angry as me about Newcastle at Old Trafford, but all, all has turned out well, has it not? And you, you must be happy enough. Enough, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm still not, I still haven't forgiven them for Wednesday, but um, thank you, Sean. Sure. Mm-hmm. Now, it was uh, great to see Pope and Joe Linton back. Um, thought the two of them were, um, were two of the standouts. I think Pope made some vital saves at. Some pretty big moments in that game. I mean, I know we've conceded two, but um, they had a couple of other big chances. Obviously, goal disallowed as well. So they, they we made hard, hard work of it, but ultimately we've done the job, we've done all we could. Um, that was in our hands anyway. So yeah, you've got to be pleased that um, <laughs> and we scored four goals away. I mean, that is that is a good good output. It's what we've done pretty well most of the season is is banging goals in, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a positive um, end to the season. I think there's a lot to take from it in terms of um the future in terms of the um what what we need to improve on i think there's they'll they'll have learned a lot from this season hopefully um i'm hoping that it means there's going to be a lot of work done on the squad this summer um but yeah i think it is a it's it's a positive end to what's been a really difficult kind of drawn out season um so pleased yeah, pleased a, a good word for it. And I feel like I felt like the pressure was on today. It was on a Wednesday and they kind of crumbled there in a pretty desperate way. And then that just piled the pressure on for today. There's all sorts of kind of what ifs going into this game. What if you lose again? What if you finish eighth? What if there's no European football? What happens to all of the good players who kind of expect European football as a bare minimum? And I just feel like navigating that was was massive, John. And I suppose for Newcastle to be 3 0 up at half time, despite what came afterwards is just a, a pretty emphatic way to get the job done. How did you say it, mate? Yeah, totally agree. I um, think once we got the first goal, um, it felt like we were in control. Um, got the other goals that we needed. Um, I always say we go 2-0 ahead, um, you know, in Eddie Howe, Newcastle, and we don't lose. Um, and we've only drawn once. So when we're 3-0 up at half time, felt really confident. Um, somehow in the second half, conspired to <laughs> like find a way to let them back in and just did a typical Newcastleism on that. Um, but I thought the way that we then handled the game at 3-2, we, you know, we got the opportunity, the, what felt like it was going to be a penalty um, and the reaction from Bruno, um, you know, off, off the back of that rebound to, to get their pounce and then do his 15 celebrations in the corner, <laughs> including the bucket hat and whatever else, um, you know, it's was, it was fantastic to watch. And um, yeah, it was a massive, massive win. We've done everything we can now. Yes, we've got to wait and, um, you know, hopefully just watch Man City routinely win the FA Cup next week. And and then we've got European competition. But um, there is always that lingering frustration of, you know, could we have managed this better in this last week? Yes, and I suppose, you know, sixth place is the one that got away 
we're going to talk about you know the what ifs maybe a little bit later in this in this show but i do just feel that after the the horror show on wednesday the frustration the the kind of the sense of loss like charlotte says to finish above manchester united after failing to do so last season when we we should have that's that's quite a big thing to achieve particularly when it should there's still much to be done in terms of needing manchester city to do what they need to do against manchester united in the fa cup final to secure europa conference football for us but there's definitely a sense of achievement there there's a sense of you know in terms of how this badly this season could have gone with all of the mitigation and all of the just kind of endless damaging injuries I think seventh place and I think achieving it through our own ends was important because we could have gone there today and got beat and then if Man United had also got beat at, at Brighton you kind of stumbled into it but I think getting to 60 points scoring four again um Charlotte you've got some some good stats on that I believe about the just the sheer number of goals Newcastle have scored this season it's absolutely remarkable and it also makes you feel if we could replicate that goal scoring next season and sort out the other end of the pitch a little bit then we could be well in the hunt for Champions League football again so tell us about this season yeah I don't have the stats for how many we've conceded but I don't think we even who need cares? to think about that yeah who cares about <laughs> it's not, that it's not consequential yeah fuck that um we've scored uh, we've ended the season with 85 Premier League goals which is our most in a top division season since the 86 goals in 1960 1961 which predates all of us so it's the first time we've ever seen us score this many goals um absolutely massive i think especially as you mentioned this has been quite a long season and we've had all of these mitigating factors and we've had often only one striker available to us sometimes no strikers available to us this season too so to finish the season with our sort of highest number of goals since the 1960s is just it, it like if you just step back and kind of zoom out it feels kind of mind-blowing to me like we haven't had <laughs> we haven't had an out and out striker in some of these games we have had in strikers playing when they're not very well or they're not fully fit we've had um goals coming from um defenders we've had goals coming from midfield we've we've just i just think it for me it's it's a very positive thing going into next season that we've been able to score so many goals. Like you say, if we can sort out that sort of the, the back line a little bit, Nick Pope's back, he looked great today. That was a very, very, awesome. very exciting thing for us. I know we'll talk more about the team and the performance in, in later on in the show, but um, I, I just I just think like, wow, zoom out. That's an insane stat to me. I, I think for, for how who is, is a kind of opening talked about how he, he wants to play kind of attractive football and attacking football like that. It's got to be a, a massive, a massive positive for him to, to see them go in and score more goals than last year when we actually got into top four and um, kind of break that. I think he'll be thinking there's a lot of potential for, for this squad if we can get players fit and, and sort out the, the defensive kind of frailty side of things. Yes, and there's much to kind of get into about about the season, what's gone wrong, what's gone right, and what it'll mean for next season, particularly in terms of the squad, who's going to be here, who's not. But for day in, today in this podcast, we're just going to concentrate on this this game mainly. And what a game it was! Four two, four goals scored away from home in the Premier League. And Brentford, they're not a they're not a good team. There's a reason they finished sixteenth, but it's also not like a piss take place to go to. It's not Bramall Lane. It's uh, they didn't have an absolutely horrific defensive record at home or anything like that. Only, I say only, but they conceded 30 goals at home before uh, in 18 games beforehand. But certainly they aren't shipping threes and fours at home every week. So I think to go there and do what we did to them, and we missed a lot of chances as well. They, they missed a couple of chances too, like you've alluded to, Charlotte, with Nick Pope. But Newcastle, the best, Newcastle are playing well and doing things like that. When they're winning games comfortably and you walk out thinking they probably should have scored more though, mm. more there. And that's what they did today. Very, very important. I've just had a look through our fixtures, and although it's not an exact science, I believe the last time how could really look at a squad and think I've got 90% of my first choice players available here, even though not all of them were available or not match fit, was Crystal Palace at home back in October before we played Dortmund. Uh, and I think Isak maybe was on the bench that day, but generally most of the players were fit. And then fast forward to today, and you've only really got Botman and Tonali missing, I think, from the matchday squad out of everyone. Gordon. Gordon as well. 
So there were three good good <laughs> players missing. But in terms of Gordon, at least you have the 38 million replacement ready to step in who scores. So I thought today was the, the first time in a long, long time. We'll have only months, but what's that, six months or so since um, since Palace at home, which feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, that game was close at the Seller Cup, which it feels like Rafa Benitez was manager for. <laughs> the, the season's been so long. But the fact today that Eddie Howe was able to look at a squad and pick something resembling his version of Newcastle United, I think that that was apparent in the performance. And I feel like after a, a kind of ropey first 10 minutes, Newcastle controlled, they controlled an away game for the first time in fucking ages. You know, if you think about the away wins, even at Villa at Fulham this year, Magnus don't count, not a real team, not a proper <laughs> football club anymore. Um, it, that that was as pleasing for me, and I feel like it will be for how that... <laughs> we'll get into the second half and the start of it. I, I personally feel like you're always going to get a bit of a pushback from a team 3-0 down at home half time, which didn't manage great. But, but the key thing today is we just got a little glimpse of what we're supposed to look like, and it felt a lot better. And I think Charlotte, one of the key reasons for that has to be Nick Pope, Nick the goalkeeper. Pope. Nick Pope, it was, it was absolutely, for me, it's Nick Pope. Nick Pope made three saves today, three clear saves, three excellent saves that we absolutely needed him to make. But it, in addition to that, what he offers is just, it, it's just a completely different type of keeper to, to Dubravka. It's it's so refreshing to have him on the pitch. We were talking about it during the game. He's off his line. He's at the edge of his box. He's, you know, he's, he's not, he's not, um, He's not right on his line just watching balls roll past him and then blaming <laughs> <laughs> blaming his defenders and getting angry with them. Sorry, Dubravka, but that's what I've seen you do. What's frustrating is seeing him come in today and I know that you, you don't want your um, players who have been injured to come back unnecessarily early but I don't feel like Wednesday would have been unnecessarily early based on his performance today he didn't look rusty he didn't look um, uncomfortable he didn't look like he he needed you know a little bit of time to get into the game he was right in my opinion and I know it's Brentford but in my opinion he was right back to his um his sort of excellent goalkeeping self and so um, and so it's so frustrating seeing that performance today and thinking, oh man, the the the, the saves that Dubravka didn't make on Wednesday, he would he, like uh, Nick Pope would I can't say would have made them, but probably would have made them. But I do think that he made the difference today. I think I think there's a comfort across the defensive backline as well, knowing that he's there rather than Dubravka, and there's a lot less sort of. Tracking back, there's a lot less need. The players can play further up the pitch. They can press much higher up because they know who's behind them. And, and there's just a, a confidence there um, from from the rest of the squad. So I think he absolutely made the difference today. I'm delighted he's back. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing him next season. Yeah, uh, I, I I can't disagree with anything that you've said, Char. Right. I think um <laughs> You can't. Well, no, and... Um, it's it's not just Wednesday, it's Saturday. Like, yeah. you know, could he have played against Brighton and, and what a difference would that have made? Um, he, he just changes the way that we, we play at the back. Um, and I don't know, is that part of it? Because we've got different, you know, almost like shuffle the pack defenders. But look, he's he's clearly our best goalkeeper at the club, has been for a while. We've severely missed him since, um, you know, he went off against Man United after that freak injury. And looking back at kind of the amount of goals that Dubrovka conceded in that period of time, you know, there has been some of that's down to kind of the amount of chances that are conceded, but how much of that is because of how Pope commands the box and how he does get off his line and how he does kind of keep a hold of all of that. Um, it's, it's so, so important. So um, yeah, it was great to see him back today. Great performance. And I think we counted two or three where we thought, would that have been saved by Dubrovka? Not too sure. Um, and ultimately that's the difference between winning and losing today. It was that Tony saved the header, I think, for, for Pope was the big one, wasn't it? Where it felt like that was a difference maker. If, if Brentford had a score at that point, then we're, we're under a lot of pressure. Um, and and that, that game then becomes kind of a lot, lot more difficult. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, the big thing for me is just he's, he's a proactive keeper. He's, the, he's a keeper that will yeah. come out and kind of, you'll take potential <laughs> kind of problems on problems because he just comes and deals with them. Whereas I think what we have seen with, with Dubravka is he's not quite got that confidence to kind of leave his area and, and come out and kind of take control of situations. So I think it's just a common influence on the back four. They know almost they don't have to be perfect. They can make kind of an error and Pope will get them out of it. If the season goes the same, if every single injury goes the same, but Nick Pope is available for all of the games and if, if Joe Linton is even available for kind of 50% of the games fully fit that he missed, 
Newcastle probably definitely finish fourth. <laughs> probably agree. definitely. Yeah, I agree. And that's, I, I think so. I, th- I thought you saw that today. You saw uh, the muscular press back, not the half arsed press, not the unsure press, not the non-existent press that we kind of saw against Man United in stages on Wednesday. It was, you, you have the ball at the back, we're going to press you high, not just with the front three, not just with the midfield three, but also lads from the back are going to step out. And we almost haven't seen that from Newcastle away from home all season. Really weird. I'm, I'm thinking back to West Ham away. We didn't see it in spells. Thinking back to Wolves away, we didn't really see it. It's just, it it, it almost needs, this is maybe a criticism of how, you almost needs plan A to be executable because there's nothing beyond that. And then Brentford couldn't cope with it today. Newcastle yeah. just created chance after chance in that first half in particular from that press. Joe Linton is such a big part of that. But mm-hmm. Nick Pope is a huge part of it because mm-hmm. it allows the back four to push up as they did. And then, like you said, Ben, there's a few times the ball comes over the top and there he is at the edge of the box ready to sweep up and head the ball and clear the ball. Whereas when Dubravka plays, he's on the goal line. So uh, it was a real kind of like bit of nostalgia today watching that, <laughs> thinking, oh yeah, that was us. The, you know, the reason we've been dog shit away from home is because we can't do any of that. And teams like Brentford are just not going to be able to cope. And again, it's not just the four Newcastle scored in the first three they scored in the first half. They should have been, they should have scored more in the first half. And they have an, off, an offside, kind of a tight offside goal disallowed. Again, comes purely from a press in midfield and... Joe Linton, wow, what a miss he's been. No wonder they've given him a, a new deal and just just essential essential football from a team that needed those two players to kind of function as a proper football team and what we've seen without them. And it's definitely an issue to try and solve for next season because we can't go into next season with the same vulnerability and reliance on a couple of players. And another one is Alexander Risak again today. He scored... He could have scored another. He's he's created several. He's missed a couple. Another player who I felt Brentford just could not deal with, particularly he's running in behind. The amount of times that Brentford defenders think they're in control of the ball, they're in control of the situation, all of a sudden he's in on goal. It's like, how the fuck did that happen? It's just Alexander Isak, isn't it? John, what do you make of his performance this season? Yeah, Isak this season's just been excellent for me. Um, he's I can't think of any club in the world that could afford to buy him. Um, from her. and uh, and I think you know when there's when you see these links on on uh, social media where it's like, well, you know, Arsenal would like him for eighty million. Well, I mean, I'd love a date with Margot Robbie, but I can't see that happening anytime soon. You know, so I I just I just think that he's he's just exuded class. Um, you know, he he gets those chances, he takes those goals that he needs to, um, and yeah, for for me, he's our world class player that we just can't part with at all. Well said, and because we're just going through the class, lads, um, <laughs> Bruno Gomares gets a goal, wears a hat, doesn't scream of a player who's desperate to leave, I don't think, and I know you may be thinking to yourselves, you're reading too much, Alex, into a man putting on a hat after scoring a goal, but he just... This he just... is a man that also <laughs> held aloft a flag, though, as well, Alex, mm-hmm. it's, you've got to join it all up. <laughs> yeah, join the dots. Hag, hag, flag, hat, flag, what else has he done? Jump, he, jumping he, on hoardings and stuff like that, he's... He points badge. to the badge a lot. Yeah. You said kissed, I'm kissed fucking it, staying. Kissed it loads today as well. <laughs> yeah, kissed it loads. Yeah, maybe the I'm fucking staying was the most important. Yeah, I, w- I would suggest that might be. But he was just back today. Was he had his mate in midfield? You know, there was a, there was a lot of kind of crossfield ball stuff going on. There was just, I feel like he's in his element when he. I, I think since he was on forty, was it no nine yellow cards for three months or whatever, and he's, he's not got one since. He became kind of more positionally aware, but then he did. You did see the kind of throwing himself after players, maybe getting done a couple of times today, mm. missing the ball. But the, he just wants to be in every part of the action, and I just thought it was a. It just felt like the Newcastle United of old, and I, and I felt Bruno was a key part of that. I think as well. Bru- well, I don't think Bruno's also been one of our key players who's managed to stay fit this season. Yes, like that is he's been absolutely crucial. Are you telling me he's due. No, 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 he is not Joe. He, he, he keep it, wrap him in cotton wool and um, what's that? Bubble wrap and and put him in a cupboard for the for the summer. No, I just mean he's been so integral. Like we've talked about all these mitigating factors. We've talked about the players that we've got back and how much of a difference that's made to our game and how if they had been um, here, uh, Pope and, and half of Joe Linton and 
perhaps we'd have got fourth. Well, imagine where we'd be if we hadn't had Bruno. Imagine if Bruno had got some kind yeah. of injury. Um, it, it just it doesn't bear thinking about. It wouldn't have been any. We wouldn't be anywhere near as jubilant today because he's integral to our side. He's he's so important. He's such a personality, but he's he's just he's just so good. Getting himself into position like we didn't get that penalty. Okay, it doesn't matter. Free kick parries back and he's there he's getting into that position and he's and he's ready to kind of sort of attack at any at any moment i just think he's so brilliant and i love him so much you know the fact that he got on the score sheets big but it just it just doesn't we have to see what the summer brings and like luke edwards said on this pod a few weeks ago as newcastle fans we're just going to have to accept the fact that the clickbait merchants of mm. the world it's easy bait, isn't it? Bruno and Isak, because they're very good footballers who play for the seventh best team in England currently, that better teams are going to want. We're just going to have to accept that there's going to be daily links and quotes and all this stuff, uh, you know, attributed to agents and family members. It's just part of the football landscape these days. But they all seemed really happy. The fact that Isak, is he finished with 21? Yeah. Yes. 21 in the Premier League, the 25 league. overall. Yeah. Good figures for a player who has kind of only really been consistently fit since March, February, March. Yeah. Um, you know, remarkable statistics. And Bruno scoring today alongside Barnes, I thought that was really important. I thought the fact Barnes gets a game, you know, we're going to talk lots probably about the season and the summer on Patreon and the transfer window and the squad. But Barnes is just a, a signing that still doesn't seem to make a ton of sense because... Eddie Howe, when he signs, says it's crucial that he can play both sides, but then won't. <laughs> um, then he won't play him ahead of Anthony Gordon, and he won't switch Anthony Gordon. So where does he fit in? Well, he's got a kind of centre forward goal today. Mm. You know, great header, back post header. No chance of saving that, and his, his contributions to the game were all kind of consequential. You don't notice some loads apart from that, so maybe he has a you know potential future playing through the middle for Newcastle because we're going to be short of strikers, whether we keep Wilson or not, I think, because there's not loads of money to spend this summer. But... Just a good day, you know, even Jacob Murphy getting on the score sheet after kind of becoming a bit, uh, you know, an assist machine in uh, in recent weeks. Th- there was just so many positives to see the season out on a high and it just felt like a different version of Newcastle um, because of those players that we've talked about. It, it's good. It's, it's a good thing when they all play. That's important. They're all available. But it's even better when they turn up because there's not loads of teams like Brent- Brentford can do or a lot of the Premier League can do when they all turn up. And we've been kind of... We've, beat that, we've had that taken away from us this season as a football club and as a fan base and you just got to hope next season they're all still here and they're all still playing at the same time. So Newcastle have finished seventh with a great away win. There is going to be lots of talk. We'll have a full season review uh, coming up this week for you, but we'll get we'll kind of start it now. Ben, we've, we've, we've done the business today. Four goals, three points, that's all that mattered. But there is inevitably going to be, you know, some attention, some conversations on uh, was it enough? Was it a good season? And there's there's the potential that, you know, this gives it a gloss. Whereas when you take stand back, like, what do you think overall? Seventh place in the Premier League, probably Europa Conference football, but we can't say that yet. What are your thoughts, mate? I mean, on on paper, it's 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 solid. But I think when you look at the competition that we've been up against, I mean, the front three have kind of run away um, in the league, and I think it, we, we even with our full team, I, I don't think we would have been catching them. But I think when you look at that the teams we've kind of had to compete with. Um, Villa started like house on fire and, and looked very good kind of up until maybe February, maybe a little bit later than that. Um, <laughs> but have had like a catastrophic fall off in terms of their their levels. And you look at how they've secured Champions League, basically relying on the other teams all failing. I think Spurs literally threw away a, a glorious opportunity without two weeks of get, uh, two um, like midweek games. They haven't been in Europe this season. And, and the state of Chelsea and Man U... Um, in this season I, I just think I, I don't want to be too critical in Newcastle but I just think in reality um, <laughs> we, I've been kind of laughing and, and mocking Man, Man U and Chelsea most of the season and yet we've finished on level points with Man U and, and lost out to Chelsea so it's it's hard to, it's, it's frustrating it's, it's, it's hard to kind of <laughs> for me to kind of think oh well this has been a great season I, want, I, I think had we have probably not got top four last season I probably would have been saying, well, it, it's okay because we're, we're not quite that team yet, but I know what we're capable of. Going into the season, I felt like I felt like six would have been a good season. I think that would have that would have represented success. Um, the biggest part of that is qualifying for Europe and hopefully the Europa League. Now, 
Well, if we finish, we finish seventh. But what's the background to that? Well, we lost um, our big blue chip signing for most of the season. Um, we've had, you know, we had a period of time in December where we had literally 12 or 13 fit first team players. Um, and we had to go with the same 11 over and over and over again. Um, I also think that the managers probably learned a hell of a lot this year about how to manage these different competitions and, you know, maybe to trust the squad a little bit more earlier. I mean, I think the first three or four games we played the same starting 11 pretty much. Um, and at that point you could have already been thinking about, right, how do we keep this fresh as we go? Um, but no, overall, I, I, I think it's been, I, I don't think you can say it's been a bad season, I think is where I'd go because I think the other thing we have to remember is some of the moments that we've had, um, that, that win at home against PSG, um, which is the, the standout moment of my St. James's Park life. Um, and then you've got Sheffield United away 8-0. Um, the way that we tore apart Man United in the League Cup 3-0 at their place um, for me was, you know, up there with the performance of the year as well. So I think we've had some amazing moments, um, but it's about taking the opportunities. And I think that my only criticism is, are we still bottling some of these big moments, I think, to the League Cup final? And I know that wasn't this season. Um, but then in this season, you've got Chelsea, Stamford Bridge, you've got AC Milan at home, possibly Dortmund at home as well, to be fair. I think I think the crowd turned up that day expecting us to win and, and we didn't deliver at all. So, mm-hmm. And then, of course, Wednesday night was a massive opportunity. It was in our hands. If we go there, perform the way that we know we can, we probably win. Um, and we come away with you know, a 3-2 defeat and you know, having to rely on other results potentially to to finish where we could have finished. I think the main frustrating thing for me today is that um we can't we can't actually celebrate European football. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's it's so fucking annoying. Like we can't actually celebrate any kind of achievement. Well, I mean we can celebrate finishing sixth and finishing above Man U and those are achievements seventh, and seventh. 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 Oh, oh god, my brain. Oh, I wish we had finished sixth. That would have been great. Well, it's a good oh. sorry it cut you off mid flow, but that's I suppose that's the, the crux of the question, isn't yeah, it? It's like yeah. It feels good today because we've just scored four goals and performed. But if we don't get European football, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. Yeah. So in, yeah. in, in that context, context, how do you think the season's gone? The fact that we're relying on Man City. Yeah, um, I don't love that for us. I think, I think it's gone okay in the in the face of everything. Like I don't, I probably am not as far over to as as Ben is on the. I'm disappointed that we finished where we finished in relation to Manu and Chelsea. Um, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of okay with it in the face of the bands and the and the and the players out injured that we've had. But I do feel that you know we have made it harder for ourselves. I think we have done that. I think there have been legitimate questions raised this season about um, player choices and team selection, which means the same thing so i apologize but um you know like team selection tactic tactically like what have we been doing i think there have been more questions about that this season and i think they've been valid questions but i i don't i I just don't want to say it's been it's been bad like i don't think it has been bad we've finished seventh we have potentially got some european football coming it is shit that we have to rely on city it's shit that we can't sit here after a 4-2 win at the end of the season and, and sit here like jubilant that we've got, um, you know, potential interesting teams coming to St. James's Park next season. But um, I think overall, I'm I'm just, I'm okay with it. I'm not over the moon, but I'm okay with it. It's it's not been a bad season. Is that it, like, yeah. But, it's, it's, but it's just, out. I just think it's, it does feel like we've, we've left a lot out there. And as I say, it, it's, it's, there's just an element of frustration or like what if just a, a couple of tweaks like i mean I, I genuinely probably would have been very different had we would have won on wednesday uh I, I would think be six I'd, so. yeah it would have been six <laughs> and I, I think i would have been I, I would have been a lot more positive i just think we've we've almost kind of <laughs> we've we got ourselves into a great position and we've kind of just slipped up at the last point it's kind of, i suppose it was right you, you brought up the cup final last year again i was buzzing to have made a final but it's like that last step of just not yeah. being able to take and it's almost like that um, as a club, kind of as we're growing and, and what our ambitions are, it's just like we, we, we kind of seem to just trip up at the, the last hurdle and it's kind of what is it going to take for us to get over that? Obviously, <laughs> a lot less injuries would, would be nice. But again, I come back to it. I, I think you've got to put your best best team out there every time, your best 11. And I don't think we did that on Wednesday. And, and it's it's cost us ultimately the, the kind of the fact that today we could be saying we're in Europa League and we can't. So... 
it's just it, it's a yeah it's a it's a it's just frustration that it's frustrating that we've we've not got that kind of clarity to to kind of be celebrating today interesting points from everyone i am um, i think seventh is probably the bare minimum i remember a lot of conversations around january uh even a bit of december but mainly january early february before the villa result of kind of get this season finished or the conversations were it's okay if we finish 12th or it's okay the season's been so bad we'll just finish 11th it's fine and i always thought that would be completely unacceptable i thought i'd be so far below acceptability that the manager's job would have to come into question and, and i'm pleased that he and the, the team and everyone have have proved that that with this team despite the injuries would have been miles below what they're good at now it's important to say manchester united and chelsea when they tell the story of their seasons injuries would come into it for them as well mm -hmm. so it's not just us i yeah. probably think we have mm -hmm. had it worse i think mm -hmm. it's and villa as well if i've had some major so that's the thing is almost like when we it's kind of like we i hear a lot of people talk about our situation but everyone in the league has pretty much had to go for injuries and it's like i just think maybe we didn't quite adapt as well as, as others did in the squads man you and chelsea and, and probably spurs and villa have deeper better that's squads it. than yeah. us yeah. I feel like the World Cup last winter has had a knock-on effect in terms of the injuries you see in the Premier League this season. It feels like there's just been kind of continuous football and there will continue to be with the Cup of America and the Euros this summer. So that's going to kind of linger on into next season and there may be a proper break beyond next season for footballers uh, at the top level. But I also feel like you can't really, you know, Newcastle have had league finishes in the Premier League and I'll give you a couple of examples you know when the kind of uh, second season under Bruce and the, oh, I can't remember the exact, was it six in a row at the end or four and six they mm -hmm. win mm -hmm. to get up to 12th that place or, run, or 13th yeah. place and I just think every or most Newcastle fans knew it was bullshit they weren't a good team they weren't the 12th mm -hmm. best team in the league they had yeah. some kind of fixtures at the end of the season some some good teams to play at a certain point um, and it suggested that the following season would be a massive struggle which it was even when Newcastle finished 10th under Benitez with a record low points for that position, um, I think everyone was hugely appreciative of that side coming good at the end. But again, it was very much a case of the the result for, for us there was avoiding relegation. And, and 10th was almost just a bit of maths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it sounds <laughs> funny, but it was. It was just the way the fixtures fell in the final. They had a great feeling of winning against Chelsea. I do feel Newcastle are good value for the seventh place. I think mm -hmm. we're a much better team than Man United. I think mm -hmm. they do themselves a disservice by relying on goal difference, but what a goal difference to finish mm. above Man United. And they should have finished above Chelsea and they should have definitely pushed Spurs and Villa a lot more. I feel like whatever happens in the summer, even though lots of teams have injuries, Newcastle have gone into too many games this season against bad teams with no centre forward. That's got that's got to end because I'm thinking off the straight off the back, I'm thinking Luton at home, they score four without a centre forward uh, from the start of the game. Um, Bournemouth away and Bournemouth at home they don't play with centre forward that's three fixtures in the Premier League there that just can't be happening that can't happen again so the fact that they're good enough for seven the fact that it's probably European football and even if it's not it would it was very close to and the fact that they've managed to kind of score as many goals as they have and along the way give us some great memories John you referenced them but I also think winning that Sunderland game was was just really important that could have really mm -hmm derailed the season and when I think of the what ifs of this season and there are many but I also I kind of I want to go the other way and think oh well, what if Sunderland got back into it when Joe Lytton goes off and it's 2-1 or what if um we hadn't held on against Man City at home to have ended up reaching the quarterfinals or you know what if Luton had held on at St James's Park or Bournemouth had held on there are so many points of disaster that they managed to navigate that actually maybe that's the that's the big story for me is it could have been so much worse mm. and if you think about Matt Ritchie coming on to score an equaliser <laughs> that was crucial um, with an assist from Joe White yeah, I, think th I think of Bruno Gamarge's goal at Nottingham Forest to give us a crucial away win when Forest were all over us and probably should have had a penalty at 2-2 you know there are so many the moments. West Ham at home 3-1 down oh, come yeah, back perfect. to 4-3 yeah. yeah. perfect, kind of perfect example or even against Spurs at home when there's just not enough defenders to put in the team Mm -hmm. So and they end up winning four nil against you know Spurs won that game they'd qualify for the Champions League that's what mm -hmm. that are the rules you're allowed to look at individual fixtures now and say if 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 so with all of that I just think it's been a, a good season this podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle home of the four pound pint on match day that's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture the offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers be gamble aware over 18s only. 
visit begambleaware.org. Uh, be drink aware, and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk.